Hello everyone, today I want to talk about one of the most innovative and exciting spacecraft concepts in recent history, Skylon. Skylon is a single stage to orbit space plane design developed by British company Reaction Engines Limited, and it's probably the closest thing that we have to a real life SSTO. And ever since I found out that Kerbal Space Program 2 has large cylindrical cargo bays, I really wanted to try and recreate it. Unfortunately, attempting to make a real scale version of Skylon resulted in this bug that causes highly complex vehicles to just collapse into an unusable pile on the floor of the VAB, and after my VAL mission, I really just I couldn't. So instead, we're going to go ahead and make a micro scale Skylon, which actually works a little bit better for the engine scale. The Rapier engine in KSP-1 and 2 is actually based upon Skylon's engine, the engine that would make SSTO possible, the Sabre. Skylon's Sabre, which stands for Synthetic Air Breathing Rocket Engine, is a unique engine design that can power the Skylon to hypersonic speed both in the atmosphere and in the vacuum of space, and it can do this by using a hybrid propulsion system that can function both as a rocket engine and a jet engine. So at low speeds and altitudes, the engine draws in air from the atmosphere and burning it with onboard hydrogen fuel to generate thrust, i.e. Uh, liquid fuel and intake air function, like a jet engine. However, at higher altitudes, where there is insufficient air, the engine then switches to rocket motor mode, where it takes in liquid oxygen from onboard tanks and mixes it with the hydrogen fuel for combustion, functioning just like a rocket engine. One other key function of the Sabre is its pre-cooler. This cools incoming air in less than one one hundredth of a second using a network of tubes that are filled with a lightweight metal hydride, and it's this rapid cooling that prevents the engine from overheating, allowing it to operate efficiently at high speeds and altitudes. Now, the Sabre in real life, hypothetically, none of this actually exists, it's all a on-paper design, uh, the Sabre is capable of propelling Skylon up to Mach 5.5 in the atmosphere, and then transition to rocket mode to reach orbital velocity. We can't get quite as much mileage from the Rapier engine in KSP, but we can still make it to orbit without a problem. But as you can see, the, uh, the vehicle is now largely complete, so we can go to orbit soon, and let's see how I did. Does it look... Uh, it doesn't really look uh, anything like uh, Skylon, but when I was talking about scale, you know, the real Skylon only has two Sabre engines. This spacecraft only has two Rapier engines. Building this vehicle to have the same sized fuselage as Skylon, we'd need to have lots and lots of Rapier engines, so it's kind of a compromise of a build, really. I really hope maybe in a KSP2 update we'll have bigger Rapier engines so we can actually recreate Skylon accurately. I think I will uh, revisit the Skylon project and do a, a, a better effort at <laughs> making a bigger version. So I'll use the large sized cylindrical cargo bay and then just use a bunch of Rapiers and kind of dress them up to look like a single Rapier engine at the wingtips. But what I will say is that we have a very cool fighter jet style uh, cockpit at the front of this vehicle. So I'm really happy with how this turned out. I think it's got a really nice sort of sleek look to it. But there we are. That was the uh, test flight there just to confirm that we could in fact get this thing to orbit. Let's go ahead and now we'll just, I'll fill it up with some cargo. The real Skyline I think could take 15 tons to orbit. Uh, this can only take like just over one ton to orbit. So it's a bit of a smaller, but it's a smaller scale vehicle. So it's fine. <laughs> I won't spoil the surprise about what the cargo is though, so we'll just, just uh, get on with the with the flight. So I switched up my colour scheme to uh, match the black of the real Skylon concept, although I added some go faster racing stripes because you've got to add go faster racing stripes to make your spacecraft go faster. Um, speaking of going faster, let's make the footage go faster because the frame rate is not great, uh, as is the as is the way with Kerbal Space Program 2. So I can speed the footage up to make it a little bit smoother for you guys watching at home and. Uh, well, you might be watching anywhere, really. Where are you watching this from? Are you watching this on a spacecraft on the International Space Station? Then do let me know. I would be very interested. And also let me know, can you play Kerbal Space Program 2 on the laptops on the International Space Station? I'm guessing it's a no, actually, because you guys might not know this. Did you know all the laptops on the International Space Station, they're only Linux and Mac OS? So they probably wouldn't be able to run KSP2, because KSP2 only runs on Microsoft stuff. And the reason why the laptops on the International Space Station only run Mac OS or Linux is because it's dangerous to open windows in space. But um <laughs> Anyway, let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the flight again. So um, we're beginning our ascent by just uh, holding a nice sort of shallow angle of attack, maybe 10 degrees on the nav ball. But we really want to try and get those rapiers into high power mode. So after about 450 meters per second, they start outputting a lot more thrust. So now we're just going to fly flat until we hit that magic number. Now we have, as you can see, our surface velocity is rapidly rising at a much faster rate than it was before, and we can start really nosing up 
not too aggressively again because we want to try and get as much speed built up in the atmosphere well you know in the atmosphere where there is sufficient air for the rapiers to function in jet engine mode because jet engine mode is much 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 more efficient than closed cycle mode which is the uh, the rocket powered mode for the rapier engine i know i'm kind of saying all of this as if you guys have never used the rapier or heard of it before even though it's like a mainstay on this channel but i'm guessing i've had a lot of new subscribers i think we've had like nearly 20,000 new subscribers since the release of ksp2 I'm aware some of you might not know what the rapier is and that it's based on the saber. So there you are. That's what the rapier is and that's what the saber was and is, you know. Uh, here we are, coasting up. Uh, we're nearly at the point where we're going to lose the intake air. I'm going to have to switch over to closed cycle mode. So you'll see our stats just above the green go button. We're going to switch from using air to oxidizer. Uh, three, two, one. How was that for timing? So yeah, now we're outputting a lot more thrust, uh, but... The fuel is now draining much faster, so I'm pitching up much more aggressively. I'm going to fire up that tear engine at the back of the plane there. That doesn't really work at ground level, but it works really well in the vacuum of space. It's not a very powerful engine, so we still kind of need the supplemental power of the rapiers, both for that initial part of the ascent and when we perform our circularization. But the terrier engine is great for sort of on-orbit maneuvering because it is a lot more efficient than the rapiers. So we can kind of squeeze a little bit more delta V out of this craft by using this engine. And the real Skylon has a vacuum optimized engine as well. It's much smaller than the terrier engine on this one. I think I probably should have used, oh, is it the Spark? The extra small sized vacuum optimized engine, but I didn't want to, I, I just wanted a more powerful engine. So <laughs> I stuck the terrier on. In hindsight, uh, it's not. It does look a bit funny, doesn't it? This all black and white space plane and then that weird gold cone at the back. Uh, but whatever, it's fine. So as you can see right now, I'm just trying to raise my periapsis, but I'm aware our apoapsis is not that far away. We're not going to be able to circularize in time. We'll end up re-entering the atmosphere. So when we hit apoapsis, I'm going to fire up the rapiers very briefly just to complete our circularization burn. And there they go. And oh my gosh, guys, I literally just paused because I thought I was seeing things. I realize now at this moment editing the video that I massively made a mistake this whole for the whole ascent that we just watched which was now is now over the payload has had its engine fire yeah it's a satellite there's like a little spacecraft inside the cargo bay and I unbeknownst to me <laughs> I'd accidentally turned that engine on when I fired up the rapiers on the runway so we had another engine burning inside the cargo bay of the Skylon. So that was a bit of a, a whoopsie, wasn't it? Good thing it didn't rupture a, I don't know, a liquid oxygen tank during the ascent. The, the tanks, they're built of strong stuff. Uh, yeah, I realize here that, um, you know, the fuel had drained. Obviously, it's drained because the engine has been firing for the entire ascent. I assume this was just some weird fuel bug with the games. I'm like, oh, we need to refill it because the engines are not pulled from the correct stage, I think. KSP2, I'll let it slide this one time because this was clearly uh, user error. <laughs> so here you can see me deploying the payload. I, I Generally at the moment I'm using the stack separators to separate stages of rockets and in this case remove payloads from cargo bays because I've tried using docking ports in space shuttle builds and undocking the docking port just causes the whole vessel to be destroyed and I've tried using just the decouplers so they don't leave the mothership it stays attached but it doesn't stay attached it ends up just drifting off but it's still attached to the main craft so when you initiate time warp or something it then freezes in place and it looks ridiculous stack separators I feel like are the most reliable it's a shame because then it leaves permanent debris in space and also they are heavier than decouplers so it's less efficient to use them but it also means that the Kraken is less likely to just destroy all our hopes and dreams. So that's why I use stack separators. Anyway, we have deployed the payload. So before we can go ahead and do the mission that the satellite is going to undertake. <gasps> What's it going to do? It's really exciting, but I won't spoil the surprise. Get that viewer retention up and all that good stuff. Uh, first of all, we need to perform a deorbit burn and land back at the runway. And the Kraken reared its ugly head once again here. I'm not quite sure what happened because I'm burning retrograde. But my apoapsis is increasing. Like, I think it was it to do with time warp? Because I dropped out of time warp, and then it started behaving normally. Like, the apoapsis started going down. But by that point, I'd, like, used my fuel up. So I had to just reload a quick save, and I tried again. This time, not initiating physics time warp. We'll just burn at real-time speed. Obviously, for you guys, it's fine. I can speed it up. But for me, 
I was playing at real time speed, wasn't taking no chances. And uh, yeah, I try and sort of aim it so my trajectory is sort of, I guess you can't see it because it's on the dark side of the planet, but it's sort of aiming for, I aim to put our like collision trajectory marker on that landmass to the east of the Kerbal Space Center. That's usually a pretty reliable spot to aim for, for uh, kind of a, a good space plane re-entry that takes you to the runway. Oh, parts manager. It's really annoying, like, I don't really like the parts manager, but the thing I don't like about it the most is the fact that when you right click a part, it like freezes the game for up to five seconds and it's like, oh my gosh, please just show me the action that I need. <laughs> so uh, yeah, hopefully that speeds up with all the optimization patches that are coming in and hopefully, I mean, I now I'm aware there's lots of mods for Kerbal Space Program 2, which is amazing really when you think about that, that the game has not really been out for even a month yet and we already have mods. And I'm aware, I think, that there is a mod that actually adds back right click options when you right click a part. I don't know, I've just, I've been to like Space Dock and I've just seen the list and I'm pretty sure I saw a mod that adds right click actions. So yeah, if you want right click actions, then go ahead and install that. I'm trying to keep my game as close to stock as possible and that includes you know not modifying the part rigidity and stuff um, not because i think that's the way you should play play however you want in my opinion but uh, because i'm in kind of like active talks with the developers i'm seen as a air quotes power user so i'm just sending them tons of bug reports and save files and screenshots and videos of all the bugs i'm encountering just to help them sort of help steer the process of repairing Kerbal Space Program 2 and so for that I kind of need my game to be as close to stock as possible so that the issues I'm encountering are not associated with any modifications I've made to part values or rigidity settings that it's not some mod playing havoc with the game's code so that's the reason and also because I want my videos to be representative of what you can just do in Kerbal Space Program 2 when you just get the game and you haven't got to mess around with anything I think stuff like if we ever get a Kerbal Engineer maybe we already have a Kerbal Engineer I don't know but if we, I'll have a look, I'll have a little look and I'll see if we've got a Kerbal Engineer. And if we have got a Kerbal Engineer mod, then I'll probably add that so you guys can see a constant stream of information about what exactly my flight statistics are. So if you're trying to match or if you're trying to play along with me and emulate my mission, you can kind of see what values I had for each stage. Make sure you're staying on track or if you're ahead of me or behind me. And also uh, the Delta V readout in this game. I think it could be a bit hit and miss, so it'd be nice to have a more reliable one in the form of a Kerbal Engineer Redux 2. <laughs> anyway, we are arriving at the Space Center. What I generally do in order to make sure I'm heading in the right direction is I look for the island in the distance there. I just follow that and that's how I know where to sort of point my plane on re-entry. It's not too bad coming in from an equatorial orbit like this, but from a like a polar orbit or just any kind of tilted orbit really, um, it can be a little bit more tricky to find the KSC. I've been told that um, navigation points are coming, so you can mark the Kerbal Space Center on your nav ball and you can just follow the nav ball, but until that happens, uh, that's the strategy that I use. I just follow the island. But there we are, we have touched down. We have a beautiful sunrise in the distance. Or is that a sunset? Sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's a sunset! <laughs> As the uh, sun is setting in the sky, Bill Kerman can say goodbye. Well, actually, we're just sort of taxiing down to the the space plane hangar, if we had one. So I guess he's taxiing to the VAB? I don't know, I just put, I just put the brakes on here. Uh, but yeah, the, mission, the main mission is done, but obviously we've still got our probe in space. And that's got a very exciting mission to do as well. But I almost clicked destroy when selecting it, that was fun. There really needs to be an option, doesn't there, saying, are you sure? Anyway, we're going to go to the mum. And I've said ad nauseum on this channel many times now that KSP2 is really annoying in that creating maneuver plans, you can't see your trajectory past celestial objects. So actually the easiest way to get to the moon is to not bother with making a maneuver plan. Instead, I rewind the footage if you want to see a visual example of what I'm about to say. Uh, just basically watch the spacecraft in orbit. And as soon as you see the moon pop up behind Kerbin, burn prograde. And that'll point you on a really, really nice trajectory that takes you on an equatorial orbit past the moon. From there, just sort of burn until your orbit leaving the moon's sphere of influence is much bigger than your orbit going in, because that means the moon has given you a gravity assist, which means you're very close to the surface of the moon, and that's what I did. And I think you'll agree, hopefully, that I got it. That's a pretty good moon orbit. Well, I say moon orbit, I'm only speaking hypothetically, of course, because I decided, you know what, let's just continue burning retrograde and put ourselves on a landing trajectory because we really need to circularize. We're just going to go ahead and land. And I swear, guys, I did not plan this. I'm like, oh, it's the moon. Monarch. So I'm like, let's, now there's a mon, we've seen the Monarch. we got to land on the Monarch, right? So yeah, <laughs> I've not done many Mun missions in KSP2 and uh, already I've accidentally managed to land exactly pretty much at a Monarch by accident. Like I didn't, 
I didn't plan this. I know I've done a video of me landing at this monarch, so I technically know where it is, but like, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to go and check. <laughs> but if you've seen that video, you know that I had a lot of problems with the Kraken thwarting my plans. So stakes were high. I'm like, right, it's round two. Let's see if we can land on the Monarch and have no bugs whatsoever. And we've not got that much Delta V. Right? We've only got 220 meters per second, which is obviously plenty to just land here. But if we're doing lots of little maneuvers and hops, it can run out quite quickly. So let's see, are we going to do it? Just trying to line myself up quickly as possible. Pointing sort of, I'm going to sort of switch between radial out and retrograde relative to the surface in order to get the landing and oh, just under shooting so quickly burn up again. There we are. Trying to get nice and high and then we can just very gently start shuffling our way towards the arch, being really careful not to overshoot. I did try and make things a bit more tricky for myself because I wanted to land right in the middle of the uh, the top bit where the sun is, which is obviously not as flat as the other parts. So had to be, took a bit of finesse. Hey, how about that first time? I didn't have to load any quick saves or anything, so I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. And there we are. In that good, in that good vibe to end the video on. It doesn't end. It's a KSP2 video that has not ended in sadness. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's the uh, Monarch there. And those names on screen, well they're my Patreon supporters and my channel members and it's their generosity that allows me to keep making this content, they help support the channel. If you want to join their ranks you can do so by clicking the links in the description. There's also a card to my Patreon directly on the screen as well as two other videos from the channel. Don't know what they are, they're kind of selected by YouTube for you so hopefully they're good picks. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this mission. I, it was actually a lot of fun, this mission. Because, relatively speaking, not many things went wrong. So that made it fun.